Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Lee Everett, Chief Programs Officer at Opera America. Welcome to today's discussion about building gender inclusive space and working conditions in opera. I wanna take this moment to acknowledge the land where I work and live in Manhattan. This place is home to centuries of stories, families, communities, music, dance, and art, movement and migration from the Lenape Hoking and Canarsie nations who called this place home long before history was written down. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities and invite you to acknowledge those where you reside, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Today's webinar is the second part of a multi-part series of discussions Opera America is holding on gender inclusivity in the opera field. Our first session hosted at the National Conference in Minneapolis last May was facilitated by Outfront Minnesota, an LGBTQ justice and equity advocacy organization. The next building block in our learning to make change, uh, to make change sessions is today's webinar with a more specific look at how we in opera can create safe and inclusive spaces for trans, gender diverse, and queer members of our field. We have an exceptional panel of folks from the opera field who are giving of themselves and their knowledge today. And it is my pleasure to introduce our host for this discussion, Aria Umezawa. Aria is a director, a producer, and an advocate, and one of the co-founders for Amplify Opera in Toronto. Welcome, Aria. Thanks for hosting this today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and welcome everybody watching this webinar. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. As Laura Lee mentioned, my name is Aria Umazawa. My pronouns are she, her. I'm half Japanese wearing a black sweater and today my auburn hair is pulled up into a bun. Um, I'm sitting in front of a let's call it yellowish white background with a uh, wood block print of a red tree and a house plant. Um, I'm a stage director and the co-founder of Amplified Opera, an arts organization that places artists at the center of public discourse. And today I'm calling in from Tucaranto, the place in the water where the trees are standing, colonially known as Toronto. Um, this Afternoon, as mentioned, we will be discussing how we as an industry can build gender inclusivity into opera, both on the artistic side and from the arts administration side. This is not a small topic and a 90 minute panel discussion could not hope to address everything that we could speak about on this topic. Uh, opera America intends to hold future discussions to expand on some of the things that we'll touch on today. So I think today is more about setting a really strong and solid foundation for further talks. For a little bit of housekeeping, we will begin today's discussion with a panel talk, which will be followed by a live Q&A period. You can submit your questions using the chat feature on YouTube Live. Um, I'd encourage everyone watching to start asking your questions sooner rather than later. We're taking note of your thoughts and we'll save them for the Q&A session so we can hopefully get to as many as possible. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you all of this, these, this afternoon's very special guest, starting first with Helena Colindres. Um, Helena, maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit for the folks at home. Hello, my name is Helena Colindres. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am here talking to y'all from Baltimore, um, Baltimore, Maryland, and um, the land that I am living on is actually the Piscataway land. And um, I am here in my little tiny office with barely anything in it. <laughs> um, I am a brown person with long black hair that is down. And I am wearing uh, three chains, one with my name on it, one with a stone that my grandma gave me for my birthday. <laughs> And another one for my partner. I'm wearing a pink dress and I have a white background behind me as well as a microphone and some headphones back there. Amazing. Thank, Thank you for you having so me. Thank you, Helena. Um, next, we have Jake Fedorovsky. Um, Jake, tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Jake Fedorowski. My pronouns are they and them. And um, I am calling in from the tra traditional land of the Duwamish people, uh, which were the, or who were the first people of Seattle. Um, I am wearing a black top with um, earrings and a necklace. My curly hair is out today. And uh, against a, a white background, I am also a, um, a white non-binary person. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here, Jake. Next, we have Aiden Feltkamp. Aiden, we'd love to hear a little bit about you now. Yeah, hey, my name is Aiden Feltkamp. My pronouns are they and he. I am a white trans non-binary person, and I have a blurred background with a big old rainbow flag, and I'm wearing a pink shirt with a brown sweater. I am living on the land of the Lenape as well, which is colonially known as Jersey City, so right outside of Manhattan. And I'm a librettist and an equity specialist. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Aiden. Next, we have Rose Freeman. Rose. Hi, everyone. My name is Rose Freeman. My pronouns are Z Zier. It works just like she, her, but with like a really crappy European accent. Um, what you can see is uh, I am a, what you'd imagine a white soft butch lesbian to look like. My brown hair is pulled back in a ponytail. I'm wearing a plaid shirt with a rather ornate gold and black necklace over the collar and then a um, gray, I don't know this material, jacket. Um, behind me, I'm in my living room, uh, which has a nice painting of Janelle Monet in oil glaring at us and a bookcase with some religious figurines on top of it. And you may see some creatures come by. Um, I am a stage director that specializes in new work, um, modern American opera and some traditional opera as well. And um, yeah, I wrote my thesis on empowering performers. So I'm very invested in this. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here today, Rose. Next, we have Jordan Rudder. Jordan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Um, so my name is Jordan Rudder Cavado. I'm calling in from New York City, the, the Lenape land as well. Um, I am a Vietnamese American countertenor uh, and I freelance around. I am doing this like Harry Styles kind of thing with my black hair. I have a little gray v-neck on. And, um, I'm calling in from my shared office space. Um, I'm a non-binary person and I think I covered everything. <laughs> you did perfectly. I, okay. on the other hand, did not say your full last name, so I apologize. <laughs> but thank you so much for being here, Jordan. Um, next, we have James Rose. James, welcome. Hi, I'm James Rose. My pronouns are they, them, and she, her. I am a gender fluid, uh, non-binary actress. I am white with long, dark hair, uh, and I have a sheer top on today. I have earrings and makeup on because that made me feel confident. And uh, I am in a, a picnic, like enclosed area in a park today. I am in the traditional land of the Ute and the Paiute people, colonially known as Colorado. And I am thrilled to be in such esteemed company today. Thank you so much for being here today, James. And last but not least, we have Dr. Lorraine Sims. Dr. Sims, how are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Lorraine Sims. I use she, her pronouns. I am a cisgender white woman that's 65 years old, so I have some graying hair that's not very well manicured. <laughs> I like it just kind of loose and curly. That's fine. And I, I wear, I'm wearing a teal top v-necked with a dragonfly necklace. I am a professor of voice and vocal pedagogy at Louisiana State University. And I'm calling in from Baton Rouge, Louisiana from my home where I have a little screen behind me so that you don't have to look at my kitchen. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Sims. I mean, I think we have, it's safe to say, we have a powerhouse of a panel here for you, um, those of you watching today. Uh, for the purposes of today's conversation, 
I just like to lay a foundation. When we're talking about gender, what we're referring to are the socially constructed roles, behaviors, expressions, and identities of men, women, and gender diverse people, and how these things influence the way we interact and move through the world. Um, some things just to sort of lay as a as a groundwork, gender is not binary and it is not fixed. Our relationship with gender can change over time and in fact, often does. Um, so as we are laying a foundation today, Jordan, I'm hoping we can start with you. I was wondering if you could maybe offer us a little bit of a background. Opera is a centuries old art form, but we tend to focus on 25 or so titles from its history. So this is a bit of a double barreled question, admittedly. Um, how does this established canon portray gender and how has it changed over the years? So <clears throat> um, really quickly, just in case anybody doesn't follow the, uh, the terminology, um, I'm going to get into discussions about the castrati and intravesti roles. So the castrati were, um, were singers who were castrated as usually as children, sometimes a little older, like up to, I think, 12. Um, and the belief was that that gave them uh, superhuman singing abilities. And so um, a lot of the earliest operas um, would feature them in, in leading roles. Um, and of course, intravesti is just the another word for like a pants role. Um, so that would be like a mezzo-soprano or soprano portraying a male character. Um, so from the beginning, there were gender, there, gender has been non-binary basically since the beginning of the art form, right? Um, the castrati were understood as a third gender in um, in Italy. Uh, in fact, if you see the manuscript for Rossini's Petite Messe Solennelle, it says right there on the first page uh, that it was written for the three genders, men, women, and castrati. So, <laughs> um, they, because of a papal decree, um, women weren't allowed on stage in Rome, right? So basically all of the Roman operas that were done uh, for at least through the 18th century featured um, castrati playing female roles as well. So if you look at the original casts for things like Vinci, Scarlatti, Vivaldi, if it premiered in Rome, um, it there was what I think we would, as Americans, would consider like a drag role. Um, and then this kind of, the the treble voice was assigned to these heroic characters really up until, um, I mean, to this day, but it was standard practice through the 18th century and, and well into the 19th actually. Um, Donizetti used it a lot. Um, Meyerbeer and Rossini even wrote for Castrati in uh, some of their operas. Um, on the French side, they were more into the intravesti thing. So you would have uh, women singers portraying heroes, or you, but typically younger characters. So like uh, Cherubin, um, the Prince Charming um page boys the the guy in mignon um all, however um nowadays we've kind of gotten away from a lot of that right i mean we're talking about the most frequently performed operas i took a look at opera america's own list from the 1819 season which i think is a useful snapshot of like where we were pre covid and and before um what I would call increased interest in EDI, like as a concept. Um, and what I noticed is that, at least in the States, there's a lot of American opera, which is great. Um, the Most of the pieces that feature gender fun are, uh, are comedies that and the serious works that we do tend to be in that sort of like Puccini Wagnerian school. 
Um, I personally think that in a lot of ways, we're still kind of living under the shadow of, of that very important artistic movement. Um, but so a lot of these operas that I've talked about that feature gender fluidity between the actors and the performers are, are kind of out of the rep. Um, I think some of the ones that you see pretty often would be like Clemenza. Um, any handle that gets done will feature something like that. Um, and then in terms of non-binary characters, we're kind of limited to, uh, you know, ghosts and supernatural folks. Um, in terms of the American repertoire, like these are these are roles that haven't been written yet, right? So, um, so what is happening is non-binary artists are ex we're required to fit into a tradition that doesn't have an obvious place, um, and we can't wait the like 10 years for something to go into workshopping and and mm. for something like you know of course we want to see people writing stuff for us and they do but it just it takes too long and and my rent's due in a few days <laughs> you know? jordan fair enough thank you for those insights i mean it sounds and please correct me if i'm wrong but it, it sort of sounds like you know, there was much more freedom sort of in the early days of opera and we, we seem to have become more strict as time has gone on. I wonder if any of our other panelists have some thoughts on, on, this, um, on this question as well. I'm looking, I'm looking in our side chat right now. Yeah, Aiden, please. Hey, always happy to chat about this. Um, so yeah, what, Jordan is saying 100%. And it's really interesting because I feel like the way that gender is explained or understood or cast in opera really reflects like the society of the time. And right now, in a, or at least historically in America, it's been very rigid in terms of the binary and the, and the gender binary being you know, enforced. <laughs> and and that that shows in opera. Like I even think about um, in 1911, Richard Strauss wrote De Rosenkavalier. And that has one of the most famous heroic pants roles in it. And when he wrote it, pants roles weren't really being done for a while at that point. And so they were kind of like, why did you bring this back? And the opera, as everyone knows, opens with two people in bed and like one of them being the pants role and one of them being a woman. And so when the opera came to the Met in, in New York City in, tw in uh, 1913, they were like, oh, we will only put this opera on if there's no bed on stage, everyone's fully clothed. And like, there's not even like, no one's gesturing toward anywhere that my a bed might be off stage and I was just like this is so strict and ridiculous and this is in opera which is like at the time thought to be a pretty progressive art form where now it's kind of more seen as we know as like historical art form I think it's a progressive art form it can be or should be so it, I think it's really about thinking about our own society and how it kind of plays out in our art and how I would love for opera to be more progressive and in that way just like open up our gender casting to something kind of new. Absolutely. I'm hearing from you, you know, the difference between the potential of opera as an art form and the culture of opera consumption and creation that we've, we've put around this art form. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Aiden. Uh, so I guess this sort of leads to, to our next question, which is when it comes to gender inclusivity and equity in opera, um, is the issue, are the issues simply contained to the, how we are programming, like the works themselves? And I think, Jake, I might invite you on to share some of your thoughts on this question. Yeah, thank you so much, Aria. Um, so when we think about gender inclusivity and, and equity in opera, programming is a major piece of the puzzle, as that, that's the external entity that you know, the opera company is, is, uh, is, mo is focusing a lot of their work around. Um, however, that's simply one piece. And to complete that puzzle, we must identify and work with all of the pieces that go into it. Um, so I wanna just encourage each of us to think about, you know, your daily work, the spaces you frequent, the practices you embody, the assumptions you make, and the people you interact with. 
You know, where, where is gender at play? And, and more specifically, how is the gender binary of man and woman existing throughout the industry? You know, this includes gendered spaces such as restrooms and dressing rooms, as well as gendered language. You know, are you addressing large group of people or large groups of people with ladies and gentlemen? Um, you know, how are pronouns being folded into the equation? Do your policies and communications exclude certain gender identities? When we think about this constructed gender system, what roles and expectations come along with that? This affects those working in all areas of the company from the admin offices to the production staff, from front of house to the artists on stage. Who are we hiring? Who are we casting? Who are we engaging with? And are they entering inclusive spaces and provided with equitable opportunities? So as an advocate for non-binary inclusion who focuses on creating space for those who fall between outside or even beyond the gender binary, I'm here to ask when and where does gender exist? Is it necessary? And if so, how can it be made more inclusive of all gender identities? So I know that I've answered the question with a few more questions, but I believe that's where this work begins. You know, for many of us thinking about gender um, and, you know, gendered spaces and language roles and expectations, it's not common practice. It's not something that a lot of specifically cisgender folks have to do. But we must start noticing and naming those instances in order to begin implementing more equitable and inclusive solutions. Yeah, Jake, I mean, I think you bring up some very point poignant questions um, in the response. Thank you so much. I know, um, Lorraine, you have some thoughts on this question as well. Um, yes, indeed. Yes. I don't see my video. Well, let me start that. There we go. Okay, well, I'm going to talk. There it goes. <laughs> um, yes, I have so many thoughts on this, this topic. And it, it is to do with programming and 100% to everything Jake just said. I, I couldn't have said any of that better myself. I, I think if we think of language as being fluid, just like gender, then it, we have to start there. We have to start changing our language every day in our everyday life to make to make things more gender neutral. And um, I spend a lot of time working and, and presenting about uh, working with transgender singers and non-binary singers and people that are outside the binary that voice teachers are, are sort of stuck in. Well, like opera, you know, we're, we're preparing the next generation of those singers and we need to find a way for any person um, to sing with whatever voice they choose and present their gender in whatever way they are comfortable and not have to worry about, are they fitting into that binary? And I know this is not gonna be an immediate switch, but it has to start with the idea that any, any voice can be any gender. <laughs> That's what I like to say. Any voice can be any gender and any voice that can sing a role should be given that opportunity. And if, if a voice is the voice you want for the role, then your job as a director or whoever that's in charge of a production needs to have, it needs to be an honest conversation with that individual. How would you like to present this character in this show in a way that may be a little bit new or different so that, so that we don't have to be in that same gender binary? Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Sims, you know, I frequently hear the refrain in opera that we're here to showcase the best of humanity or all that humanity has to offer. And it feels like we could, we would do well to broaden our understanding of an inclusion of what that word means. Um, thank you. Yeah. Jordan, I know you have some thoughts on this one as well. Would you care to share them? Oh, I sure would. <laughs> I, I really love what um, Dr. Sims said. Um, so just a little background for me, I studied as a baritone all through college and switched to countertenor um, in for grad school. And I work that way professionally now. Um, so I, I found that a lot of our conceptions about how we organize voices can be very um, proscriptive. And it, I think it would behoove the industry to look at the voice as a means of expression 
broadly. Um, I will say in terms of sort of like day-to-day -day functioning of all of this, um, the audition process is really uh, the enforcement mechanism for the gender binary. So, I mean, us non-binary people who are working, right, or trying to get a job, once once we're in a room, there's unions, there's there's people and and it there's the the desire of the company to make the job work. But I any single one of us who's ever had to do an audition has horror stories. And it's it's part of part of it is just the attitude that people take towards singers who are treated as you know, like um, this this necessary evil <laughs> to deal with, and and then part of it is like it's great to say that what what do you bring to the character? But at the end of the day, if I don't butch it up in the audition room, I'm not going to get the job, mm. and, and I have no recourse. Right? Nobody nobody wants to. I, there's no way to like hold somebody accountable and and anyone who's suffered discrimination before knows that like you can't like prove that that is what happened i mean and, and it's why we all get so like up in arms about it absolutely jordan just in the interest um i rose rose in the comments has a fight has a lit with some thoughts on precisely this so maybe um i'll invite rose into the conversation yeah yeah, um, let me lower my hand there. Yeah, this is, uh, it's so much, right? Because I'm also like, as a staging director, I live on the other side of the table, which like, I would like to note that we have constructed this system of one side of the table or the other, of creating a hierarchy um, as a way of convincing performers that they're, uh, they are powerless. And of course they are the most powerful one in the room. You know, Anyone on stage can start doing whatever they want and it's going to take us a considerable amount of time um, to stop them, um, either by shutting off all the lights or tackling them or whatever that is. They could be doing whatever they wanted. And I think that's a real fear among um, arts administration, right? But it, when you look at gender, right, when we're starting to divorce ourselves from mandated gender and mandated gender roles and really starting to explore the multitudes that humanity can contain, um, we have to start admitting that gender has been utilized as a shorthand and as a method of enforced economics through assigning roles through other people. And there's other parts that you can see this in opera, such as the Fox system, right? It is a useful, sometimes economic system that can allow for seasons to be held and you can pick material based on the singers that you have within your um, your canon, right? Who, who you've hired for that season. That's really where that started and where we go from that. And I think gender is actually part of that as well is it, it ends up being a shorthand. But if we as creators are able to step outside of that and maybe divorce is too harsh or, or triggering of a word, uh, but instead uh, de-escalate from our attachment to this, we might actually be able to create some revolutionary art and continue the gender revolution that is inherent in opera. Yeah, Rose, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I mean, um, I think it, it leads actually very well into our next question. Um, largely, you know, how you've articulated that we have created systems and shorthands and um, that we use these things to sort of um, restrict movement um, or restrict the ways we're able to express ourselves in this art form. For me, this speaks to the ways in which uh, we as an industry and just the ways that even our rehearsal rooms are set up and the way that we have um, systematized the process of opera this system actually limits the autonomy of many of the artists in our spaces and prevents them or makes it difficult for them to assert their boundaries and articulate their needs. And I'm wondering um, if this is true to the experiences of any of the folks on our panel today. Aiden, maybe you can start with sharing some of your thoughts. Yeah, of course. Um, for background, um, I performed as a mezzo-soprano for about 10 years, went to you know, undergrad, grad school, things like that, um, and then uh, transitioned and now um, have, you know, bass baritone type of voice. So these experiences that I'm talking about are kind of from a time of being non-binary, 
and being before transition. So being a mezzo soprano playing mostly actually pants roles and kind of like roles that were written for men sung up an octave and things like that, um, which I love, by the way. So the thing is, is that you can be, you know, like I, I've had a lot of, um, you know, privilege in opera and being who I am and like having the education that I had. And so there are times when I've been cast in roles that are kind of out of the box and fun. Like uh, um, I sang the pig in Higgledy Piggledy Pop by Nussin. And that's a bass role, but I sang it one octave up as like a alto role. And it was, I was a non-binary person playing a female role that was written as a man role. And like, so there's a lot going on and it was really fun because it was very much like gender bending and like kind of draggish. And it was, it was a lot of fun but the issue was is that when I was in the rehearsal room the stage director would just be very aggressive about like physicalizing like the gender of the character and caused a lot of like gender dysphoria for me and um you know I spoke with the director about it and kind of brought it up and I had thought I got my kind of Point across but it continued and so like it's weird because it's like you can have every single person in the you know, like behind the scenes casting and the pianist and you're all your cast and everyone be just like super on board and super awesome and like always like gendering you correctly and everything. But then if someone in power, like the stage director, who I was even like scared to go up to and talk to about it anyway, like I didn't call him out on it in rehearsal, which is something that I think if I had more power, I might have brought up but I didn't feel like I could. So I did go by, like, you know, off, you know, outside of rehearsal um, and didn't really feel like it was, uh, but I don't like to talk about like bad things that happen because of gender, but I think it's important to bring it up as like a learning opportunity for others that like, we all have places to grow and learn and that we need to do this learning ourselves before we come into the rehearsal space. And so having a director who had maybe done a bit more education themselves on gender and especially non-binary gender and kind of just how we can think about talking about dysphoria together and what that means and how like serious that is, um, that maybe, you know, we would have come to something that, uh, an understanding. Mm. So I will let others speak, but that was my experience. Thank you, Aiden. And and for what it's worth, I feel like that was a very asset-focused answer to, to that question. Thank you. I know Rose, um, Rose has some thoughts on this, so I might invite her to come back. Yes, um, I do want to come back sing. Okay. Yes, uh, very much so. First of all, Aiden, I'm really sorry that happened to you. Um, that sucks. Um, and I think we can actually admit that when people in power aren't doing the education of themselves, uh, this is the consequences of that. And we may think we have that education, but we often don't. Um, you know, on that note, one of the things that drives me personally insane is when <laughs> Uh, I am misgendered and there's this kind of panic apology and it then ends up becoming my job to reassure um, the person that has made this error. Um, forgive yourself, correct yourself, move on. It's your job to be educated, right? Especially if you're in a position of power. Um, I think there's also some ways that we can, you know, when I'm talking about, just trying to kind of go back to talking about like dismantling the shorthand and, you know, creating something where um, a room can have some autonomy, that I think feels like, oh my gosh, if we dismantle the shorthand, if we take this time to do all of this, we are wasting so much time in such a time constrained rehearsal environment um, because we always have time trying to bully us to get that show on um, or money bullying us to get that show on. Um, I would argue that if there was an intimacy director in that room, um, there could have been a better way to create shorthand to uh, diminish some of the gender obsession that was happening in that character or word it in a way or work through it in a way that would allow for uh, enfranchisement of the performer. Um, also um, creating other shorthands that can be allowed for an empowered room, right? Um, one of the big things I wanna encourage anybody who is um, developing opera, especially if they are developing opera outside of the traditional union contracts um, is to look at the Chicago theater standards 
Um, these are incredibly important. They were developed by Not in Our House Chicago in response to the Me Too movement and some pretty flagrant abuse that was happening in the Chicago storefront theater scene. Um, but what this does is it's a consent and information-based set of agreements that are flexible within what your company is able to do and what you are capable of doing within your own rehearsal room. And by establishing these agreements with your cast and with your standard, you create a shorthand that creates a more efficient process that is empowering and not, um, you know, dragging everyone through mud. Everyone, all the boats rise on this. Yeah, Rose, I often say upfront thought usually leads to efficient execution. Um, right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I'm actually, I'm going to pivot, pivot us a little bit, but I'd love to stick with you, Rose. Um, I'm going to pivot us into a little bit of like making space or, or um, considering what companies can do to consider um, or what companies can consider doing rather apologies. Um, I find that advocating for artist autonomy can mean challenging the status quo precisely as you've been talking about. Um, everything from who's able to speak in a given situation to the entrenched ways that we run our rehearsal processes. Uh, a dear colleague of mine once noted that speaking up often means relinquishing autonomy and put uh, anonymity rather and putting oneself in the spotlight. So I wonder what can opera companies do to signal to artists that they are open to this sort of challenge and more importantly, that they're ready to make concrete changes. Is. Yeah, I think there's um, some pretty, so I want to start this with saying that performers know that you're lying, right? Like anytime you hear the words, trust me, right? Don't trust that person, right? That's like inherent, like, hey, that's probably a lie, right? Um, whether you have good intentions or not, right? There has been too much power imbalance and there's been too much historic abuse to not, um, to be believed as an administrator, right? That's, you already are having performers entering an unsafe environment in that way. Um, so you need to prove yourself immediately, right? And that's why I advocate for something like the Chicago Theater Standards. Um, another option, which is a really wonderful way of allowing performers to maintain their um, on, an, an anonymity um, is a cast representative right? Leave the cast alone in a room, everybody else leave, let them vote on one human being who's able to come and advocate as needed when something's up, right? And just by doing that, you're showing that you understand there is a power imbalance and that you are working to dismantle that, but you are also willing to work with inside the constraints that they have due to outside forces, right? Just recognizing that. Intimacy coordinators, those are the kind of things, putting your pronouns, regardless of your gender, in your introductions and emails, right? Having those statements and having honest, forthright, non-fear-based conversations with your performers. We are so afraid as administrators of being embarrassed or doing the wrong thing that we end up doing the wrong thing out of fear and sacrificing a performer's ability to care, be cared for and truly shine and do what they need to do on stage. In the Absolutely. end of the day, we are in a leadership position and we need to act like it as it being a service position. Absolutely, Rose. I mean, I could probably hear you listen to you talk about this all day, but I do want to bring another voice into the conversation. Um, James, maybe I see you have some thoughts on this. I do. I would love to echo everything that Rose said. And I love that you brought up the idea of having a deputy of sorts, a liaison. I am literally in that role on the contract that I'm on right now. And it is a difficult task and it works much better when it's just the voice of one person. And uh, the company can use uh, contract-based protections to make sure that that person is not ostracized in rehearsal for being the voice of the company. And uh, I also work as somebody who uh, has experienced a lot of sexual misconduct in the workplace that's been gender-based, and there are anonymous reporting forms that you can come up with in your space because there may not be a safe person to go to. 
And in that work, the question I always came to was why do we need to teach people how to advocate for themselves as opposed to teaching people that they shouldn't be doing things that need to be advocated against, right? Um, I think of like the age old saying, don't tell girls how to dress, tell boys how to behave, which is of course a very gendered saying, but I think you understand where I'm going with this. And so my question is, why do we have people in power that need to be advocated against? And what are their beliefs? What are their politics? What are the ways that they behave? How do they address other people? And why do we need to consistently um, reinforce an idea that they need to be behaving in a way that's inclusive and why are we continuing to give them power and if you're somebody who is sitting in power and you found that people have had to consistently advocate for themselves against the way that you behave do you deserve to be in power and I think that sounds very harsh and I think that that's the point and I think that people really need to sit with that because a lot of the times when we have people in power they think they're the best person for the job and then all of a sudden you've find that there's been an entire group of people that have been abused by this person and their behavior, whether they were aware of it or not, and they still think they're the best person for the job. And there isn't a checks and balance system in place to hold them accountable, because we have not yet as a community gone through what accountability looks like. And uh, I think looking to like Mia Mingus's work on restorative justice to look at what accountability can look like in the workplace in a non-carceral like non-judicial system I think we can take teachings from that and apply it to the artist spaces and really reckon with why do people in power consistently need to be advocated against and is this a fine line to victim blaming because from my position it is it's oh well you're the marginalized identity well let's teach you how to advocate for yourselves I argue, no, let's teach people how to be inclusive, compassionate, gentle human beings with each other so that we don't have to consistently advocate for basic human decency. Absolutely, James. I actually, this, I would love to stick with you for a second, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, here. <laughs> because this does actually, actually funnel into our next question. Which oh, yes. Is that for those people in positions of power in the work that I do, I do hear a lot of, of goodwill and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of stated intentions to create work environments that facilitate the type of freedom that would allow all artists to produce their best work. Um, however, oftentimes the impact of the actions that are taken or the lack thereof can be at odds with that stated intention. And I think what you just spoke to um, about whose responsibility is it, um, feeds really well into this next question of what good are intentions if the impact of the actions taken continues to perpetuate harm? I love this question because it terrifies me <laughs> because the word goodwill uh, implies, uh, to me, I think we need to really reckon with what is goodwill. To me, it's concerning because unlearning oppression is is not self-improvement work, um, it's basic human decency. Uh, I, if you're familiar with the teachings of Rachel Cargill, who's an anti-racism educator, she says, you know, for white people, unlearning white supremacy is not self-improvement work, that's your literal job as a white person. And of course, race and gender are two different social constructs, but I think that that particular theory applies for gender as well. It is cis people's responsibility everywhere not to do this out of the goodness of their heart, this is basic human decency. And I think we need to frame it as not goodwill, but responsibility to marginalized communities. And if that's not your politic, then again, is this the space for you? The arts have consistently throughout centuries, as everybody here has noted, have pushed the boundaries. And so this is not about goodwill. This is about shaping the society that we want to live in. And if your activism work and the way that you interact in a space is one that you feel comfortable in, then perhaps you're doing an ineffective job because you're either centering yourself against marginalized voices like trans people. Maybe you are only cherry picking the trans voices that agree with you. Maybe you're gate gatekeeping the kinds of trans voices that get to be in that space. So I think we really need to reframe from goodwill to responsibility. And I think a good checkpoint that people can use in any sort of power that they have, because we all have power. We don't all have the same access to power because of the way systemic oppression functions, but we all do have power in individual spaces. And the question that I encourage all of us to ask is where are we losing privileges to make sure that the people who don't have them get them. 
And as an organization, where are you taking financial risks to make sure that you're telling the kinds of stories that build the world we want to live in? Where are you having difficult conversations with producers that may have different politics? Where are you having the different kinds of conversations and spaces that are going to push you towards an inclusive space as opposed to one that's just tolerant? I hear the word tolerant being thrown around a lot, especially, and it absolutely drives me nuts because I don't want tolerance. I want celebration. I want acceptance. I want trans people to be cherished for our identities and to be celebrated on stage through artistic mediums, you know? And I think oftentimes companies need to reckon with the fact that they have to take a hit financially, reputation wise, et cetera, in order to build the world that we want to create, because not everyone's going to agree with it. And if you're trying to please everybody, as a company, you will end up harming a lot of people. And so we are teachers, right? Like art is a huge teacher. We put something on stage to represent the world that we live in. And if you're consistently putting in the kind of world that is palatable, you're probably not creating the impactful art that you want. And I would argue that impact is more important than your pocketbook. And eventually the money will follow if you build the kind of audience and the kind of community that you want to have. So that's my question is how do we reframe from goodwill to responsibility? And then where are cis people losing privileges in order to platform trans people? Not just in terms of representation because representation is a slippery slope. I mean access to power. Where are you losing power and privilege as a cis person in order to make sure trans people who have not had a voice in the community historically end up getting that access to power and have a way to continue building the world that we want to live in? Absolutely. James, you've touched on something that I think about often, which is when we we talk about these these issues um, in our industry, we tend to conflate aesthetic aesthetic and political conversations. And in fact, there are two separate conversations. So I think you, you really illustrated that with their answer. Thank you so much. I am Thank gonna you. press us forward a little bit um, and bring uh, Helena back into this conversation. I wonder, we're, we're talking a lot about uh, accountability. Um, oftentimes when we talk about uh, about issues of inclusivity, equity, equi equity sorry, my goodness. Um, a common refrain we will often hear is that companies are limited by what their donor base or what their audiences will tolerate. Um, and I wonder specifically, are we using donors as a scapegoat? When we, when we look to our audiences as limiting factors to what organizations are able to do, changes that are able to be made, are we using donors as scapegoats? Do we have more control over creating change than we are perhaps prepared to accept? Um, thank you so much for having me uh, for this conversation. I This is something I'm very, very passionate about as somebody who is like marginalized through a lot of different identities that I possess, um, being um, uh, neurodivergent, having ADHD, having autism, um, and being native, being femme presenting, being trans, being non-binary. Um, and so for me, I, I always like to look at things through like an intersectional approach. I think it's really, really important. And I love that James um, talked on the fact that um, we all have different kinds of privileges in different uh, situations. Um, like there, while I am marginalized in a lot of ways, like I have a lot of privilege in a lot of ways too. And it's very important to remember that just because you're marginalized in one area of your life um, doesn't mean that that like takes away any of the other ways in which you're participating in the systems that are in place. Um, I like, I'd like to share a quote from Paul Robeson, which I hope y'all know about, but if you don't, um, he was a really amazing civil rights activist, athlete, uh, scholar, um, uh, musician, just all, all around amazing person. And um, he said that artists are the gatekeepers of truth. We are civilization's radical voice. I live by that every single day. And I think it's very, very important for us to remember that um, it's important what we say, but it's also important what we don't say. And at the end of the day, revolutions are not made in one day. They happen every single day, little by little by little by little. And I think that thinking about revol revolutions as being, you know, one way or the other or good or bad, things like that is what's going to get us just... <laughs> in the place that we're in right now and we're never going to be able to move forward. So I think that it's really important for us to um, recognize the ways that we take part in the patriarchy, transphobia, racism, ableism, fatphobia, all these things. 
because at the end of the day, race is very important in all of these different things. Uh, money is very important when it comes to all of these different things. They're all connected to each other. And we have a lot of power as people, um, as people in a rehearsal room, as people who are actually putting their physical bodies on a stage. And um, I've heard a lot in my career, um, oh, well, you know, as a singer, I just don't have power. Yeah, maybe as one singer, you don't have as much power as, um, you know, a director or something like that. But at the end of the day, like the only way that we make change is by working together as a people. And so if there's only me talking about transphobia, like, yeah, nobody's going to care. But if everyone in my cast is making sure to, like, correct people when they're misgendering me or, um, you know, caring about what the restroom situation looks like or um, advocating for for uh, fat phobic, uh, I mean, uh, fat, fat people in spaces where fat phobic comments are being presented, you know, things like that. That's the only way we're really going to move forward. And so change can look like, um, you know, a, a small little they, right? Um, and it can also look like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna go out here and sign a whole bunch of petitions, or I'm going to donate money, or I'm going to do whatever. At the end of the day, you have to recognize that every little action gets us closer. And this world can change. We're taught in this like rugged individualist capitalist society that um, we really don't have that much power um, as people, uh, and that's just how the world works. And we're we're taught in school that it's bad to have an imagination, right? That um, my dad told me that when he was in school in El Salvador, um, he would get uh, he would get hit on the head and and be told, "What are you thinking of pregnant birds?" you know, because birds only lay eggs and, you know, things like that. And it's, it's those kinds of little comments that, that young children are, are being told over and over and again, that makes it hard for them to see the world in which they are respected and they are loved and they are supported. Um, but at the end of the day, we just have to keep remembering that we're not alone here. Yeah, we were born alone and yeah, we'll leave alone. But <laughs> right now the living, the living life is all about loving and supporting everyone else that's around you. And that's how I think this change is going to happen. Uh, we cannot be putting all of the, the onus on the people who are giving us the money. Because at the end of the day, like my body is on that stage. Like I do have control over my body. I do have control over the actions that I do with this body and so if we all recognize the power that we all have together and if we all focus on you know correcting people with pronouns and and little things here and there that's how we're gonna we're gonna move forward as a people and that's how we're gonna see the stories that really represent us as a community and really protect all of the marginalized people that are out there Elena, thank you so much for that response. I mean, I hear, I'm hearing a real call for, for folks out there to really become more aware of the power that they have um, and to use that space that they can take up to advocate for each other, uh, creating a sense of communal responsibility for the work that we produce. Thank you so much for those thoughts. I do, I'm noticing that the chat is very alive with questions right now. So before we get to our q and I do want to sort of bring all of our panelists back to answer maybe one question to lead us out of this panelist section, which is um, we've identified a lot of issues, I think a lot of um, opportunities um, as well that are facing our opera industry. And what are some next steps that companies can do to create conditions um, for art artists and audiences alike to fully participate in this art form? And I, maybe I'll start first with James, if that's okay. Yeah, uh, this is gonna sound extreme and that's why I think it's important to um, vet your company and vet your audience and vet your board. Learn their identities, learn their politics, make a chart, put it up on the wall and notice what their salient social identities are, whose voice is missing, whose voice is loudest and whose voices have the most power. And from there you can determine what the gaps in your company are and you can determine 
whether or not your company deserves to survive under its current guidelines or whether you need to do some radical shifting in order to mirror the world you want to create or whether you're going to decide you are not going to be part of the progressive world. I don't like binaries, but I do think your actions are kind of one way or the other. We're at a crossroads. You're either going to grow or you're going to get left behind. I want you to grow. I think everybody else here wants you to grow. If you're unwilling to do the work, I'm not interested in your survivor. Amazing. James, thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll toss it next to Dr. Lorraine, if that's okay. That's awesome. Thank you. I, I love being part of this conversation and I've been in my own little corner. I'm a queer woman, so I have some, you know, association with being discriminated against. But I also am a college professor at a pretty fancy, you know, university. So I have a lot of privilege because of that. And so I'm using my privilege and my empathy to teach people who are in the same position that they need to, you know, step up and learn what they need to learn and quit putting all of the onus on the marginalized population of anything to to help them grow. So I'm trying to be the voice that will help them ask the right questions and go to the right resources and to realize that for voice teachers, accommodation is like the worst word they keep using. I'm like, you don't make accommodations for your transgender singers. You just teach your transgender singers, your non-binary singers. You teach a voice. You teach a human. And if you have any empathy and know how to be a kind human, then you don't have to make accommodations. That's about all I'm going to say. Thank you, Dr. Sims. Uh, Helena, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I, um, so for me, I think that it's really important for me to live my life, like fully in my truth. And um, to really just like, like speak, like, like, uh, speak out when when I need to and, um, and listen when I need to as well. Um, I think it's, it's really important to recognize that, you know, we all have the power and, um and what we say is really important and also what we don't say is really important. So like, I really just want to make that like really clear for everybody. And at the end of the day, I do that by um, wearing my traditional dresses in um, audition rooms and correcting people when they're not using the correct pronouns for me. Um, colonial terms cannot express my gender identity. And, um, you know, like I, I explain that to the people that are around me. And so um, that's what I do. And also I make sure uh, I'm, I'm a voice teacher as well. And I make sure to have a non-gendered approach to teaching voice. I make sure to not put classical music as like the like place where you have to start for any other genre. I, um, I make sure not to ever put anything in like a hierarchy or anything like that. And that's how I'm doing that. Amazing. Thank you, Helena. Uh, Jake, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I guess kind of building off of what Dr. Sims was talking about, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about empathy, you know, I think it's really important that we all are refraining from making assumptions about those, you know, who we are interacting with on a daily basis. You know, instead of making those assumptions, engage with that person, listen to their story, and really, you know, focus on connecting with them and affirming their experience. If we can all start to do that, that, you know, that approach with th that empathetic approach, I think is going to help um, push us to a more inclusive and, you know, diverse and equitable place, um, which we're all, you know, striving to get to. So that, that's my little recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Uh, Jordan, what are your thoughts on this question? Um, so I think we could really exercise some imagination when it comes to streamlining the audition process. You know, people get tired, they get grouchy, they have to sit and listen to singers all day. It's exhausting, I'm sure. Um, you know, people always say, I know within 15 seconds whether or not I want to move someone ahead. So like, you know, we, so then why are we going and paying our $40 to go sing 10 minutes if you're checking out after the first few seconds and, and this is because um there is simply no place for application fees in in a uh in a structure that is going to meaningfully address edi goals 
Um, and so there is going to be necessarily by, by opening up the, the gates and gatekeeping less, there's going to be a, uh, a larger volume of applicants and singers. And so I, I don't know what the specifics would necessarily look like, but I would really encourage folks who are in charge of those decisions to, to start thinking now about, <laughs> um, about how to structure auditions in a way that the people on the other side of the table can, can do their job and we can do ours without this extra stuff that, that is essentially just performance of, you know, cis heteronormative white society. <laughs> Absolutely, thanks, Jordan. Aiden, what are your thoughts on this question? Um, I love to come in and just give book and reading recommendations. So I think that if everyone, here's my two big book recommendations, just for you as a person, if you're a cis person, read Trans Like Me by C.N. Lester. They're a non-binary opera singer in Europe and just a fantastic book. Great place to start. And it's all about classical music. So you'll love it. And then as a company, my favorite book to recommendation, recommendation is Invitation to the Party by Donna Walker Kuhn, which is kind of a how do you create an inclusive environment for your audience? Um, it's a lot about kind of audience um, equity. And then uh, I, I, I mean, I'm a broken record. I say this on every single panel. If you want to seriously audit your company and find those places to really make those changes, hire a consultant. They'll change your company. I promise. Like, that's the way to go. So that's what I have to say. Amazing. Thank you, Aiden. And um, I'm known for using sports metaphors that I'm ill-equipped to understand. But Rose, would you like to bring us home then with your recommendations? <laughs> I'm not good at sports either. <laughs> um, yeah, I would recommend that we remember as arts administrators and directors that this is a labor issue. Um, and this is an advocacy issue as well as an arts issue. Uh, arts leadership is a service position and you service your audience, you service the art form, and you service the performers in their ritualistic connection to the audience, right? That, that is the trifecta that you're constantly doing. So stop being so afraid. Your, your money will come. It's going to be okay. And let's all do our jobs. Amazing. Thank you, Rose. And thank you, everyone, for your very generous and amazing insights through this panel discussion. Um, as we mentioned at the top of the show, or top of the webinar, I guess, 90 minutes, <laughs> it feels like a, a incredibly insufficient amount of time to get really deep into any of these things um, that we've been discussing. But I hope that this has given many folks at home uh, inspiration to can start their own or maybe continue and deepen their own learning. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn us over to some of the questions that we've been getting throughout this panel so far. Um, I see a question from Amanda Smith. Should the audition process change, especially if we're trying out the benefits of everyone's experience? Uh, so pick show, cast, communication, then staging. And how should we market these shows in a way that benefits uh, benefits marketing, and expresses the stories of our singers. Does anyone have a thought on that question? I do. Jordan, uh, go for it. Yeah. Um, so definitely attire is kind of a another policing thing that we can just kind of, we can do it the way the Europeans do and just show up in whatever we want. Um, in terms of marketing, yeah, I, I think that if you want to celebrate your artists, then you should definitely do that. I mean, the, the opera industry, I think, has a lot of opportunities to improve in terms of marketing and, and it'll make you more money. It'll put butts in seats and um, because people want that like parasocial connection, right? They, they want to feel like they know who you are as much as they want to know what the show is about. Totally. Any other thoughts from our panel, Aiden? Of course, it just went right out of my brain. Um, 
I mean, marketing, like you can be creative and market anything fun. Um, oh, auditions. Yes. Um, I think auditions can be greatly improved. And I think that, you know, we've kind of seen it uh, in the pandemic, how we can use things from afar. And I mean, think about the environment, even like we need to travel less, you know, and having everybody travel so far to these auditions are not only really expensive for all the singers, um, but it's just really bad for the environment. And so I think if we can have more like regional kind of like auditions with a bunch of companies at the same time coming to the same place and doing the auditions at once. So people have to travel less to get more companies to see them. Or if you do a lot more like, um, I mean, recordings are also kind of a barrier to entry that the better your recording is, the more money you have probably. So that doesn't work as well. But like thinking about just listening to the voice and li and kind of looking into that person as an artist um as like a first round so that you don't have to see everyone you only see the people that you know kind of fit what you're looking for for whatever that show is and that's a whole other thing but just think about expanding auditions um in terms of less travel for singers whatever that means to your company and then also just again coming in with a panel that kind of understands gender just straight up so that if you walk in as a non-binary person they them singing you know carabino or whatever they're not going to misgender you or ask you why you're wearing what you're wearing you know just basic stuff absolutely Aiden what you're what you're describing there for me sort of speaks to this idea of how can we remove barriers to access through the audition process both through travel and just through how the audition is set up um, so thank you for that uh, I have another question from Catherine. I, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Go for it. Um, in addition to the audition process, what about the rehearsal process and on stage? I'm wondering I, that I imagine that question is referring to like specific actions that can be taken. Um, any thoughts about that question? Helena? Yeah, so like um, people kind of mentioned this earlier, like taking away the need to say like, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, things like that. Um, Cause like, if we're starting it off like that, like if that person has gender dysphoria, like they're already tuning out, like they're trying to like self-preserve, like we can't even get into like the good art we was about to make before that, right? Um, at the end of the day, like, we also kind of talked about this earlier, but like, um, you know, like a lot of people would like to like hide behind the idea that like the character you're playing is a woman, therefore I must use she, her with you in the, or or if I misgendered you, it wasn't really misgendering, it was just talking about the, the, the woman character you were playing. And it's like, yeah, no, like we need to not, because I've been having to pretend I was a woman for how many years, you know, like I'm not interested in that anymore, no you know, like, and so like, <laughs> For me, I think that like, you know, language is gonna have to be the number one thing that a lot of people are gonna have to think about because it's not us trying to be pretentious about pronouns, like for real. Like I, I assure you, that's not what it's about. Because like for me, I literally like, when somebody misgenders me, like my brain, it goes into like, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh kind of mode, you know? And it's, it's really like, like for me, I'm seeing that you are seeing me as woman or diet woman. And I'm not interested in either of those, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think language is one of the main things we have to work on. Absolutely, Jake, you seem to, you have some thoughts. Yeah, I would just add to that, like think about if we can start to make changes, you know, have more gender inclusive language and, you know, start to remove some of those super gendered spaces that exist within, you know, your, your rehearsal halls or your, you know, performance spaces. Think about the anxiety that, trans and non-binary folks don't not, like that anxiety goes away right like they are now able to bring their full self to that that audition process that performance process that rehearsal process if we can remove some of those things it, it all it is doing is allowing for these humans to show up as their authentic full selves and put their entire you know all of their self into that work why wouldn't we take steps to make that a, a reality? Um, and why are we continuing to, you know, support these these systems and these processes that are adding that layer of it, of it, adding that layer of anxiety for those artists? I mean, it just to me, it just doesn't. I don't understand why why we wouldn't be making these necessary changes. Absolutely, Jake Rose, your your hand is up. 
Absolutely. Um, one of the things I, I like to think about is that uh, I am so much more interesting than my gender. There's so much more to me than that. And there is such a tendency, especially because it is a, a, a current political hotspot to fetishize non-binary people and trans people, um, even in the rehearsal room. Um, so taking out some of that, you know, yes, the language is important, but also, you know, as I like to say, people are dying, Kim. Um, how are we ensuring the safety of trans and non-binary people? Not through just language, although that is important, but also through action. Are we providing safe housing where we have vetted the person that is providing that housing? Um, are we taking, you know, are we providing a separate dressing room that is, you know, non-gendered, or are we having a conversation with that non, you know, non-binary person so they can be in the dressing room that they're comfortable with based on those accommodations? Back to Chicago st theater standards. Are you issuing transparency in your casting? Are you hiring trans and non-binary uh, designers and um, uh, leadership, right? So that voice is in the room, right? It's action and, and how you create that, that room. It's not just language. Um, it, it has to be how you're keeping safety. An awareness of our environment as the environment as well, I think is, is what I'm getting from this. At answer. the end of the day, yeah. non-binary people got to eat and not die just like the rest of us. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Rose. Also, I did not expect to have a Kardashian reference in this panel today. So thank you for bringing that into the space. <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> Happy to do that. Um, our next question comes from Dana Kaufman. Um, what pedagogical resources can you recommend or what suggestions do you have for educators teaching opera composition? Um, I don't want to tell, volunteer anybody to answer this question first, but I feel like Dr. Sims, <laughs> I saw you nodding right well, out the gate. <laughs> I'm not sure I have exactly what the answer to the question is, but there is a lot of material out there for, uh, I'll go to my field first. There's a really great new book called um, Queering Vocal Pedagogy. And so if you start there, and, and that book is fabulous. Uh, William Sarland wrote that book. And it's a fabulous book for voice teachers to read whether they currently have trans or non-binary students just because that makes you think about singing in a different way. So, and there's also uh, music education, honoring and validating transgender students in music education. And I think that's a fabulous book that was written by um, Matthew Garrett and Joss Palkey. And I would recommend both of those for anybody who's even tangentially related to education in, in this area. I'm going to see if somebody else has something specific for opera because I actually don't have a resource for that. Anybody else on the panel? Jordan? Um, I do, yeah. Um, so, oh, sorry, sorry, Jordan. I didn't mean to speak over you. Um, I'll be quick. Um, Liz Hearns wrote a book um, about trans voices that's very good um, and written from a cisgender point of view, but is very good. And then um, to toot my own horn, um, the anthology for trans and non-binary voices from New Music Shelf that just came out has a bunch of opera and art song that's written either by or for trans and non-binary singers. And I think that's a great place to start. Amazing. Thank you, Aiden. And Jordan, your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I just, I think that sometimes we get like really bogged down in the way that we talk about the voice specifically. Um, if, if it's something that concerns you, study vocal pedagogy broadly, like understand how the instrument works because it's an invisible instrument, but it's not intangible. And I, I see Lorraine, I, I would actually love to, anyway. Um, it, we're, we're talking about like laryngeal tilt and the speed at which folds vibrate. It's, it doesn't like change because of, because of socially constructed definitions, right? So I wouldn't worry, like, like do the research, you know, and, and do what you need to, to feel comfortable with this. But it, at the end of the day, we're talking about something that we all have. <laughs> and, um, and in terms of opera composition, it's same. It's the same thing. Like just to to understand how the voice works, understand vocal idioms. The 
performers do come whenever they come in terms of the cop process I, I actually get brought on a lot <laughs> for pretty early on for things but um but yeah that's that's my spiel about this stuff is the singing nerd <laughs> I'm sensing a nerd fest afterwards um, I just want to make sure we're getting to as many questions as possible um our next one comes from Julia Moulin Murat um thoughts on asking for preferred pronouns within artist contracts <laughs> I am seeing a lot of like thumbs up, a lot of aggressive nodding. Uh, would anyone like to, Helena, would you like to say something? Yeah, um, I just, whenever I hear like preferred pronouns, I think, yeah, it's always a really iffy thing because I know for me, I don't just prefer they, them. I don't accept nothing else. You know what I mean? Like, so for me, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> So like at the end of the day, I think that um, it's better to just say like your pronouns if you're comfortable sharing them. And then that way, if if like, if they don't want to say the pronouns, they, that gives them a little place to, and maybe give them more than like just one tiny little space, but like maybe a little bit longer to kind of talk about that if they need to. Because I know some people that are like, no, you know? And then also like some people that are like, don't use pronouns for me at all. Just say my name, it's as simple as that, right? So I think that like, having it be bigger than like a tiny little line and to not put the preferred before it would be like the best thing. But that's Absolutely. just me. <laughs> Thank you for that, Helena. Um, we have another uh, question from uh, Chris Christiane Myers. Uh, help around costuming when the gender of the singer is not aligned with the gender of the character. What can a better co collaboration be as gender is considered between performer, director, and designer. Talk about it. Talk about it. <laughs> like it's it's really as simple as that. I know costuming is a particular one because uh, when race and gender come into costumes, suddenly we're like dealing with human bodies, hair, presentation, gender, like all of a sudden it gets pretty squiggy. Um, but those are the conversations you need to have in those fittings. Um, and, you know, shout out to costume designers. It is not an easy job because you are dealing with human bodies. Um, but like, you know, give room for dysphoria, right? I give myself room when I got to go put on pants at Kohl's for my dysphoria in the costume fitting. There may be room for, we need to put that room in there for dysphoria and like have those conversations and accommodate for that because it's a character not a person. I, I've played ladies before as an actor. It's fine. But I might have an issue about it for a second and I need a minute. And then Absolutely. I'm going <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Jordan, did I see you had a thought on this one as yeah. well? Yeah. You know, I'll share an anecdote from grad school. Um, there, there was a, often a lot of discussion about, you know, expectations and sometimes we're given the advice especially as young singers to like not be too difficult and so I remember the first couple of jobs I was on I I had this headspace of like well I'm, I'm just gonna wear what they want because I don't want to be the annoying person who says this costume isn't gonna work because then maybe I don't get hired again and then maybe I you know gotta go live with my mom and dad back on the farm you know I, I mean it's we we have to like like Rose said earlier, this is a labor issue. And so the there needs to be a culture that allows for that dialogue. And we we can't be telling young singers to not speak up if they're uncomfortable. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think we have a we put a questionable premium on likability in this industry in general. Um, absolutely. I think we have time for one more question. Um, this one comes from Jack Whittle. The discussion of pronouns and the binary is nice, but I don't believe that putting band-aids on these surface issues will improve the material conditions of transgender non-conforming people in opera. What are the panel's thoughts about how the class interests of those funding opera directly conflict with the class interests of transgender non-conforming artists? How does the hierarchy deepen this conflict? I'm sorry, but I don't think it does conflict. Like I know that class is very interested 
and like financial hierarchies are very interested in keeping people in their tidy little holes. Um, but again, we are educators and um, opera is very queer and its audience base is pretty queer. And I think we can have those conversations with our donors pretty well. Like weirdly old white men love me. Um, and I will say that publicly because I ran a sailing company for a long time and that is a pretty wealthy sport. And I spent a lot of time having unabashed, strong conversations about gender and guiding and educating people who were not expected to change and benefited from rigidity. So I think we, again, it's a labor issue, it's an equity issue. And part of that is having those conversations and guiding them to being the hot new thing and educating our donors. So they're as excited and interested about this as anything else. Absolutely, Aiden, I saw your hand. Yeah, um, I, I agree that it's often not an issue as much as people make it out to be. It's very often a scapegoat. I, so I was an arts administrator until like two seconds ago. So a lot of the time they'll bring up this idea that like, well, the donors won't go for that, you know? Um, and, you know, after being in a boardroom for, you know, four years with American Composers Orchestra, um, I think that, you know, just me being there like made a change, you know, that was like the first trans person a lot of the board had ever met and it made a big difference and it made a big difference moving forward. The programming changed the, you know, a lot of stuff. Um, but it just comes down to like, don't not do something because you're scapegoating the, just say you're not going to do it because you're not going to do it. But also who's on your board? Is your board diverse? Is your board progressive? Or are the, are the board members, the people that you want to be leading your ship or you know your company i think it's a matter of again recruiting for your board diversifying your board because the more diverse and um your board is honestly the more the better it will perform it's just been shown in studies to be true so i think it's a matter of looking at your board looking at your donor list and thinking about recruiting and diversity absolutely Thank you so much, Aiden. And I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there for, leave it on that note for today. Um, but I just wanted to thank everybody for tuning in this afternoon for this panel and apologize to those whose questions we didn't have time to address today. Um, I'd also like to thank our panelists, Helena Colindres, soprano educator and activist, Jake Fedorovsky, non-binary inclusion advocate, um, former stage manager and artistic administrator, Aidan Feltkamp, uh, librettist and e equity specialist, Rose Freeman, stage director, Jordan Rudder Covato, countertenor, James Rose, gender fluid actress, educator, and DEI consultant, and Dr. Lorraine Sims, professor of voice at Louisiana State University. Um, as we mentioned, Opera America intends to further explore this topic. So please do keep your eyes peeled for more panels like this one. And you can find out more information about this and other panels at www.operamerica.org. And I think the only thing left to do then is to throw it back to Laura Lee to close us out this afternoon. And for me to thank you, Aria, especially for guiding us through this. Um, thank you so much. What a rich and full discussion. I'm sure we could do this for another several hours. Thank you, Helena, Jake, Aiden, Rose, Jordan, and Lorraine for your time today. Your insights are invaluable as we do this work to create change in opera. Um, there are several resources we want to point out as you continue to do this work. Included in the chat are links to a glossary of terms and additional information on this topic that is on uh, our member friends at Canadian Opera Company's website. Also links to Outfront Minnesota, who led our first session in this series at our conference back in May. We will send out the resources, I saw some of you asking for this in the chat, that were referenced today to all of you who are registered for the webinar, and we will have them posted with the uh, YouTube link. OA is building a full space of resources on our website for gender inclusivity, including things that are approved and recommended by the EEOC about creating um, uh, good cultural work environments. We will alert you when all of that is available. Thank you to the entire Opera America team who helped coordinate these sessions. And thank you to all of you who joined us by prioritizing your time to take in this learning today. 
We'll continue to build on our work from today going forward. Be well.